so much, Holly. Um, and thank you to Holly for the invitation and Jason and to the uh, Military Medical Museum for hosting me. And thank you all for coming as well. Don't hesitate to let me know if you can't hear me or can't see your slides. Um, so yes, I'm very pleased to be speaking about the history of prisoners war in the 18th century. Uh, I've been researching the history of disease during war, especially during the 18th century for some years now. So this talk is a combination of some previous research I've done on the treatment of prisoners during Franco-British wars of the 18th century. But I'm also very interested in thinking more generally about the practice of medicine during war and how that might help us to understand the history of humanitarianism. So what I wanna do for the talk this evening is begin by providing an overview of the details and some of the basic logistics of how prisoners of war and how captivity worked uh, in this period in Europe before I come to focus specifically on the treatment of French prisoners of war by the British during a major war of this period and that's the Seven Years' War, which ran from 1756 to 63. And this war is of interest, I think, not only because I've written a book on it, but also because the treatment of prisoners became uh, a major issue of public opinion during the war. British and French newspapers wrote and published and, and debated how prisoners were cared for during the war. And of course, the next major British and European war was the War of American Independence. And that war resulted in even more public debates over the treatment of prisoners. And in fact, it's still debated by historians. And so I'm very keen to think about how we should consider um, care and charity given to prisoners during times of war. And I also want to therefore conclude my talk with a few reflections on how this history of treatment, especially the history of, of charity and care, might help us to understand the nature of humanitarianism both today and in the past. So in Europe, across the early modern period, the standard convention stated that enemy soldiers and sailors that were taken during combat were to be held prisoner for only a short period of time, usually 15 days, before they were to be exchanged for an equal number of prisoners of equivalent military rank. And when prisoners were in captivity, they were meant to be fed and accommodated and treated much as you did when your own troops. So they were not meant to be forcefully recruited into your own forces, and they were not meant to be punished simply for being part of the enemy. And I think what's useful for us to consider when we think about the history of prisoners prisoners of war during this period, is that long periods of captivity were not normal for any prisoner during this time. And this includes civilian prisoners. So if you were imprisoned when you were charged with a crime, that was considered a temporary measure. It was something while you were just awaiting your trial um, or awaiting punishment. So being in prison was not itself a form of punishment. It wasn't common the way that imprisonment would become, especially into the 19th century. And so in that same context, prisoners were, of war were not often held for long periods in captivity. The norm was instead the short period, hence this convention of 15 days before you would try to negotiate a release through payment or through an exchange of other prisoners. Now, holding these enemy prisoners, even for 15 days, obviously presented various administrative difficulties, as you can imagine. They required armed guards, accommodation, and food. And there were official uh, regulations uh, that European nations were meant to follow that stipulated exactly how much money prisoners were meant to be given to buy their food and to buy other necessaries such as clothes. And this amount was actually agreed upon between the two sides. And each side was actually financially responsible for these payments to sustain its own troops while they were in captivity. And so I think this is a really crucial point and one that might surprise us, that it's the prisoner's home country, not the host government, that was financially responsible for sustaining their captive prisoners. And even though, of course, this was the case, you can imagine that prisoners still presented a significant administrative and financial burden for the host country, even though the home country was still paying for them. And so finding accommodation, finding guards, finding medical care and provision, and of course, all being sourced during wartime, alongside trying to secure this reimbursement um, from enemy governments really strained uh, capacities to their limits during European wars. 
On top of this kind of basic level of sustenance, prisoners were provided with what was called the king's or the queen's bounty. Um, and that was provided by their home country while they were in captivity. And this was an allowance that provided soldiers and sailors with the funds to buy additional necessaries, things like clothes or fresh uh, vegetables and fruits, things that was, it was actually a similar practice to what you find um, when soldiers and sailors were on campaign, that they had this kind of extra bounty. And obviously the amount and the method for the subsistence, subsistence varied. Um, and very often these were all parts of agreements that had to be worked out between the two warring sides. And if we think about how prisoners of war were therefore not actually providing any real service to their home country, but were still costing that home country money in terms of um, accommodation and pay uh, and food stuff, exchanges of prisoners were very strongly welcomed by both sides to, as this real solution to this problem of imprisonment. Now for people at the time in the early modern period, the negotiations and the arguments that took place about how to agree and exchange of prisoners were a mixture of appeals to law, appeals to custom, and appeals to humanitarianism or morality that were very often buttressed all underneath by practical strategic motivations. So what you see in the language of these negotiations is how being a civilized and humane nation meant that one adhered, that you would follow basically the laws of nations, but it was through the application of these laws during wartime that humanitarian conditions were achieved. And one of the, one of the really interesting parts of thinking about early modern war is how war was accepted as a natural condition, very often accepted as a necessary, even though uh, tragic part of international relations. And so the laws of war were concerned with the conduct of, of war, what's called use in bello, more so than the justness of war itself, or what's often called use ad bellum. And here, what we find interesting is the good treatment of non-combatants was really one of the fundamental principles of humanitarianism and these just war theories. And hence the treatment of prisoners was a key issue for deliberations on how to wage war in what was described as a humane and enlightened and pragmatic matter. So you can see this in many of the texts of the period. Um, Emma de Vattel is probably one of the most famous uh, treatises on the conduct of humanitarian war, on the law of nations, which was translated into English in 1759. And Vattel was in some ways characteristic of this optimism that we might find in 18th century writings about the rationality of war um, and the rationality of laws of war and what is the humanity with which most nations in Europe carry on wars at present. Um, and what Vattel stressed really was the increasing use of prisoner exchanges and practices such as letting officers go on parole when they're imprisoned. These methods by which, as he described it, the natural misfortune of imprisonment during war could be avoided. And for him, they were yet another demonstration of what he described as the humanity of the Europeans during war. So alongside legal precedent and humanitarian conventions, prisoner exchanges during war were very often demanded because they were widely recognized as the most practical method to, re to resolve this problem of imprisonment. So what you see very often in writings published during war is how imprisonment was described as one of those unavoidable evils of war. And so its misfortune needed to be lessened through prisoner exchanges. So what I think is very interesting when we look at the, the kind of rhetoric and the language that's used, especially in the realm of law, is how these demands for exchanges or even sometimes refusals to have an exchanges or cartels as they were called at the time, they show how prisoners were not simply the byproduct of battles or simply symbolic spoils of war. Even if we take into account their administrative and their financial costs, what's clear is that prisoners were valuable strategic assets, especially when we think about their, their worth within the context of 18th century war, especially imperial war. So we can think about how people at the time described prisoners of war. Um, one English official explained how with the 
capturing all these French privateers, these French sailors, and putting them into prison. Um, by capturing more than 7,000 prisoners during war, this meant that French privateering was almost broken. And if the same success continued, they argued that the French king would not be able to even man his own ships and continue to fight the war. And by the same side, you can see that English authorities on their side were very concerned about the harmful effects of having their men, uh, whether sailors or soldiers captured. This would result in the interruption of trade and losses. Uh, Her Majesty's revenue would be much lessened. The nation would be weakened. The subject would be ruined. The enemy by contrast would be enriched and strengthened and encouraged. And also as they pointed out in a imperial context, the sugar plantations would be exposed um, because there's simply not enough men to actually man these ships and very um, lucrative islands such as Jamaica would be put in great danger. When we think about how one of the major problems behind all of these prisoners taken, the 7,000 listed here, is just how expensive they were to maintain at the same time. So the accounts of the British Admiralty's Commission of the Sick and Wounded and the Sick and Wounded Board, interestingly, which is the, the board responsible for medical care within the Royal Navy, were those who were responsible for prisoners of war. And they show that, for example, during the Nine Years' War of the 1690s, expenses relating to French prisoners during the war exceeded 60,000 pounds. They said that was far more than what they had expended on hospitals, and it was equivalent to near a fifth of their total expenses throughout that war. And of course, these costs were meant to be reimbursed upon the end of the war when they would receive payment from um, the enemy, but of course, that meant that you still had to subtract the care that you owed for the care of your own troops taken by the enemy. And what's very interesting is all of these negotiations happened after the conclusion of a war. So a loser in a war often owed very much to a victor because these financial negotiations were part of the process of the peace treaties as well. So negotiations concerning these reimbursements for the costs of prisoners were very troublesome, as you can imagine. Um, each side would demand exact accounts, they would debate precisely how long those prisoners had been held, and there were claims and counterclaims that often took years and years to settle after the conclusion of a war, so long after it had been officially declared over. So just in summary, this kind of basic logistics of thinking about prisoner care in this period, Imprisonment was not the, for long periods at time at least, was not the norm during the early modern period, whether civilian prisoners or for enemy soldiers and sailors during war. Instead, imprisonment was considered a temporary measure. During European wars, it was meant to last no longer than 15 days. But during this period of imprisonment, all prisoners were meant to be treated just as a host country would treat its own troops in terms of food rations and in terms of medical care. And the cost of this care was meant to be paid by the home country of those prisoners, either as part of an exchange or as part of a kind of financial negotiation after the conclusion of the war itself. Now, because of this supposed short period of imprisonment, this meant that there was little sophisticated infrastructure for prisoners of war in place. Most of the focus instead was on how to negotiate and agree exchanges of prisoners. So capturing enemy prisoners was very important to wartime strategy, but it was also very expensive. And so the solution to this costly um, expense of prisoners for both sides, that both sides desired, was an exchange of prisoners and an exchange that could be negotiated as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Now this system, however, really began to change across the 18th century. And what you see is that there's an increasingly global scope to the war, as I've already mentioned. And there's also larger numbers of armed forces involved. And what you see officials recognizing is this kind of ad hoc system. This notion really encouraged unequal exchanges, very often the return of prisoners simply back into service um, to fight against you just a few days after. And so new practices start to emerge. And most significantly what happens is that larger numbers of prisoners are captured and it became standard for these large numbers of prisoners now to be sent back to the captor's home country and to be held for much longer periods of time, far beyond those 15 days. And so as a result, the administration of prisoners also gradually evolved and these responsibilities became much more standardized. 
And so what we can see is by the early 18th century, the numbers of prisoners of war moving back and forth between enemy European nations had actually reached the tens of thousands. So between 1689 and 1698, for example, France captured over 15,000 English prisoners and England had captured almost 25,000 French prisoners. And these numbers and the geographical scope of war just kept increasing across the 18th century. So by the time of the wars of the mid-century and the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 63, European wars really had a truble, truly global remit, right? So in this war, you can see Britain fighting against France and Spain across the Americas, including the Caribbean, fighting in India, even in the Philippines, um, as well as fighting in Europe. And overall in this war, the British captured really an unprecedented number of French uh, prisoners, especially French sailors and French seamen. So a total of 65,000 French prisoners were captured and were all brought back to Britain during the war. And more generally, what we see is this focus on capturing French privateers and sailors, including French merchantmen, was part of British war strategy. It was meant to cripple French trade and to cripple French overseas campaigns and to hold these men captive. Um, and therefore, what it meant is that the French Navy and the French privateers suffered from really chronic manpower shortages throughout the war. And this is um, a really significant uh, factor in what lent to uh, France's loss to Britain in 1763. And one of the interesting things we can think about is as this French naval might really ebbed during the war because they were losing manpower, it meant that the French continued to lose the ability to capture equal numbers of French, of British sailors for exchanges, meaning that the British increasingly held more and more and just simply an overwhelming majority of French prisoners. So by the conclusion of the war in 1762, what the British were doing were simply holding these French prisoners on British soil, um, many of them being held for three or four years straight, not being exchanged so much longer than our 15 days that we started with, partly because there were hardly any British prisoners being held in France that they could be exchanged for. We think that there's over 30,000 French sailors um, and merchantmen who were held on British soil for about three or four years during the war. Now, as I mentioned, in Britain, it was the medical board of the Royal Navy that was responsible for all prisoners taken during wartime. And this board relied on a national network of agents that it had that were set up basically throughout Britain to oversee the care of prisoners as they were stationed throughout Britain during the war. And many of these agents were medical men because they were known to the sick and hurt board, interestingly enough. And especially because uh, medical men were well trusted, they were often um, senior figures in their community. And also whenever complaints were raised about the treatment uh, or the state of enemy prisoners, it was therefore medical men who were sent to investigate and to provide reports back to the Navy board. And so I think it's a really interesting um, juxtaposition here to think about how the welfare of prisoners was taken on immediately as a medical concern. One of the things I think is fascinating is just to imagine um, what this meant for British populations to have the detention of so many enemy prisoners held very often in port centers, but also in urban centers throughout a war against the French. So the city of Winchester, for example, um, and Winchester in the 1750s only had a population of 5,000. It housed over 3,000 French prisoners of war um, for three to four years straight throughout the war. And you can imagine that this invariably caused <laughs> many frictions. Many local populations did not generally welcome the arrival of enemy prisoners of war, particularly because there were often problems about finding accommodation and finding food if you try to imagine accommodating an extra 3,500 figures if you're only a population of 5,000 in the midst of war. Also, of course, um, enemy prisoners often arrived in poor condition. They usually had been transported back after a long campaign, and so they often were ill-clothed, they were hungry, and they were very often sick, very often with infectious diseases as well. What we do find is once those prisoners had settled in these local communities for some time, it appears that prisoners actually could peacefully integrate, um, and actually local inhabitants even made money very often from the markets that prisoners would create 
um, and they could even benefit from French labor that was um, offered through the, the French prisoners. So for example, there's cases where um, regulations clearly state that French um, enemy officers were only meant to travel for a few miles where they were on parole, but then we see complaints being sent to the sick and hurt board saying how actually officers were traveling without guard over 20 miles away to go to the horse races. Um, so I think we can guess that these rules were not always followed. Uh, likewise, I found complaints where the prisoner militias that were supposed to be guarding the prisoners um, were often very chastised by authorities because they were found to be taking the local prisoners drinking um, rather than actually watching over them. And very often we can see about how after three or four years of living among a civilian population, relations between what was meant to be an enemy force in a hostile land very often settled into fairly stable relations. Um, we find complaints, for example, of British girls marrying French men. Um, so obviously there were lots of social interactions available to them. What's difficult in this period of history is how, unlike in later periods, we have almost no evidence that provides us with insight into the experience of what it was like to be a rank and file prisoner of war. Rank and file soldiers and sailors, of course, were not usually literate, um, and most of them certainly would not even think to leave a record of their experience. That's, that's not how they saw the world. I have, however, managed to find what I think are the only known surviving letters of a prisoner of war from this period. These are by a French prisoner who, were, who was held in England during the 1750s and 60s. So there's 11 letters by a sailor called Pierre Canot, as pictured here, which he wrote to his wife, um, which survive in a French provincial archive. And Pierre Canot was a coastal seaman from the seafaring community of the island of Ré, that's near Rochelle. And so Cano is very much representative of these French maritime captives. Um, they are very much more likely to be privateers and commercial seamen, not necessarily naval sailors. And what's very interesting is when we read his letters, um, they follow a very standard pattern, which is actually common for letters written by captives in the early modern period. They focus not on the conditions of captivity, but rather he talks a lot about the role of providence and the duty of his submission to the will of God. So he very often is more intent on, ass on assuring his wife that he's in good health. Um, he thanks God often for her good health. Um, he writes how health is the most precious of worldly goods. And his requests actually focus more on speaking to um, others in his network to try to see if he can get some connection in order to facilitate his exchange. He doesn't actually request um, any material goods. So you can see how his writings focus not on improving harsh conditions, but instead they focus on trying to release prisoners through negotiated ex exchanges. So very much following this early modern pattern that we've seen. And again, this is why contemporaries focused on the matter of exchanges. They saw prisoners exchange as the most effective way to alleviate the hardships of captivity. And so what's really interesting about this is if you take a step back and look at correspondence in general about prisoners in this period, any complaints of ill treatment were therefore always part of broader arguments to try to settle a form of general exchange. So when there were petitions about very bad treatment by prisoners of war, those were always in the form of requests that the prisoners could should be exchanged as soon as possible. So we see, for example, when there were all sorts of debates in the early 18th century, um, these attempts for negotiations, English officials were very clear that these complaints from that were sent to them by English prisoners in France, they said these were just trying to move Her Majesty the sooner to consent to a cartel or to an exchange. And so they warned against making any hasty negotiations that might disadvantage the English in the long term as a result. So in many ways, we see there's an acceptance of poor conditions during imprisonment. And in some ways, we can see this even in how prisoners were chosen for exchanges. So the aged, the wounded, and the ill were always to be first exchanged because these were, as they were described, these were men least able to endure the hardships of imprisonment. So these reports of poor prisoner conditions were part 
of wartime negotiations in which each side used these reports of poor conditions to try to basically elicit a desired response from the other side. And we can see this in, these, in all the correspondence going back and forth. So when there were complaints about the English that were suffering in French prisons in the 1703, the English Privy Council in response, what it did is it reduced the French prisoners allowance um, those that were being held in England, they reduced it to the same amount that they heard that the English prisoners were being um, given in France, and they actually directed and encouraged that French officers that were being held prisoner in England should write as to France as many letters as they please to be forwarded by the board and told that till by their representations of the matters to the court of France, the English prisoners have have received better treatment than hitherto, these reductions would continue. So it was a kind of tit for tat that they were very much conducting. And they said, if this would not change the French practices, they would even stoop so low as to stop prisoners' medical care. The same thing happened in the, six, uh, in the 1740s, when again, Spanish authorities seemed deaf to British demands to improve the treatment of British prisoners that were being held in Spain. And so again, what we see is the Secretary of State gave instructions that Spanish prisoners should also therefore suffer in Britain and its colonies. But the British officials said, this is not from any motive of cruelty or barbarity because the English were incapable of that. It was only to try to see whether a little less good nature on our part might not procure a little more humanity on there. So a bit of back and forth. And so on both of these occasions, British officials and their correspondents were explicit that these measures were designed to compel the enemy to provide better care for their own English who were being held prisoners. So these report treatments therefore did lead to these kind of short-term attempts to ameliorate prisoner care. But overall, you can see how the real solution to prisoner suffering was always the arrangement of prisoner exchanges. So harsh conditions, and I think even more importantly, reports of harsh conditions were not only common, but they were essential components of negotiations over the exchange of these very costly and troublesome captives and to exchange them for valuable military manpower on the other side. So although we often have these complaints of poor conditions, authorities use these complaints to petition for an exchange rather than to try to reform prisoner conditions. And so what I think is interesting from our conception is um, how this humanitarian concern with alleviating suffering through exchanges was a central consideration. We see it in these writings. So humanitarian concerns to alleviate suffering arrived long before the 19th century, long before the modern age. But at the same time is this took place within diplomatic and strategic use in which each side used reports and petitions of poor conditions um, to negotiate for a better outcome. Very often we can see how English correspondence mixes moral outrage. They talk about, you know, the enemy practices towards prisoners as contrary to the usage of all Christian and civilized nations, but they use that alongside threats and negotiations, even in the same letter. And they're very explicit about this. Um, there was one example in 1703 I liked where they said that they would actually be quite happy to give the new orders about reduced um, prisoner conditions to the very literate, sorry, that's my dog interrupting, um, to the very literate prisoners to actually enclose in the letters back to France to make sure that it would actually reach French officials. So these reports of ill treatment were always part of wartime negotiations, and especially they were a part of exchanges, which were themselves central to wartime strategy and logistics. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the details of the conditions of the French prisoners that were held in Britain during the 1750s and 60s. Um, because I think the debates that we see, the kind of public debates that happened over their care are quite insightful. Now, unfortunately, there's, I don't have an image from the 1750s and 60s, but this is in a painting from the 1810 um, when very similar practices followed. So this is actually a painting done by Britain captain of a French prisoner of war market. And I think there's been much more scholarship on um, French prisoners of war in Britain during the Napoleonic Wars because of the numbers. But actually what's interesting is we can see that this is actually a buildup of things that have started from the 1740s onwards. So we think 
what's interesting about what happens in the 1750s and 60s in Britain is that there's a lot of attention paid to these enemy prisoners, these French enemy prisoners held because of their unusually long captivity of three to four years and the very large numbers that were held, um, you know, somewhere around 35,000 and how this led in some ways to very poor conditions for the prisoners, but also because the language of people at the time, this care given to prisoners really tied into broader British cultural concerns about charity and about humanity during wartime and what the right thing was to do. And what we all can also see is because there were such large numbers of enemy prisoners, um, it meant that the British public could see them because they lived in their midst, as is the case, for example, with those 3,000 French prisoners held in Winchester. These French prisoners were held very often in just local buildings because they didn't have set um, places for them, so they took over hospitals and castles. Even sometimes they were temporary, temporarily billeted um, with local land hoard, landlords. And so you often see that there are newspaper reports on these prisoners as part of the kind of ongoing awareness of the war with France. Now the French prisoners became a matter of very special concern for the British public when their royal bounty was actually stopped in 1758. And you'll remember that prisoners were meant to receive this as well as their kind of daily rations of food and medical care. They were also supposed to receive this kind of bit of extra money that would let them buy clothes um, and that was meant to be supplemented by the French government. This was stopped by the French king. The British press claims it's because um, France was bankrupted by this time in the war. We don't really know the truth of the matter. But what happened is that the prisoners soon suffered this consequence, most notably by running out of clothes. And so British civilians became aware of this hardship, especially because when there were attempted French landings in 1759, French prisoners had to be marched away from uh, coastal areas. And so very often you see newspaper reports of the British public shocked to see the condition of these French enemy soldiers and sailors who aren't wearing sufficient clothes, especially during a cold winter. Um, and so as a response, what we see in British newspapers and also as a correspondence is that the British civilian public actually raised money um, in charities for these enemy French prisoners of war. So the largest of these charitable organizations, there were a number that were raised throughout various British urban centers, um, even up in Edinburgh, down in, up in Dundee and all over. But the largest was called the Committee on French Prisoners. It first met in London in December of 1759. This is probably the closest thing that we have to a national organization for charity during the war. It met once a week, um, up until the end of July 1760, and it was formed by public subscription, very similar to other voluntary charitable organizations. And what they did is they wrote to all the local agents, those medical men set up by the Sick and Hurt Board, um, and then everyone could subscribe and give charities, and then they also could see what was available and what was needed according to the reports on the agents. And so in its existence, the committee collected more than 4,000 pounds, and most of it was spent on hats and shoes and shirts and coats and other clothes that were sent to these enemy prisoners that were stationed throughout uh, Britain. And they were very adamant that these were only to be spent on clothes because, of course, they were also adamant to defend against any accusations that the prisoners weren't being uh, properly cared for by the state. Um, instead, they were quite clear that, uh, that actually the prisoners were being sufficient. They had were given sufficient food and sufficient medical care. It was just clothing that they, they didn't need. What I think is very interesting is that this becomes a, a widely known topic. The charity for prisoners becomes part of the discussions that the British public's debating about charity in nature in, in, um, and its nature during the 18th century. The charity for prisoners was so typical, it was actually used in a satire on charitable giving. Um, one newspaper called Charity the Mad Extravagance of the Present Age. And it noted, for example, as this kind of joke we might have, what do you do when someone keeps asking you? Then you can say, you know, oh, I've given at the, at the office. This newspaper said, you can pretend to say that, oh, you've already given to the French prisoners. So it's quite clear that this is a, a well-known charity and that people are aware also that there's constantly um, debates on the best way to spend money and the best way to actually organize your charities.
So what's interesting is there's debates that happen in British newspapers on this charity for French prisoners, because in some ways, of course, they follow the model of other charities. They follow this kind of voluntary subscription model where people send in their money and there's publications and reports and accounts on what the money is spent for. And there were debates, therefore, on the efficacy of each charity. But at the same time, there were very serious debates, of course, because this was raising money for enemy soldiers and sailors and enemy privateers. And so there was a lot of debate about whether this money would be better spent on, say, British men or British boys, um, the training, especially of street boys um, that was done in some of the marine charities that then could be sent off to serve in the Royal Navy. What's interesting is those who supported the charities, of course, made this in some ways their strength. Samuel Johnson was um, a strong proponent of this national charity for French prisoners. And he wrote that the debates over the nature of poor relief vanish in the present case. We know that for the prisoners of war, there is no legal provision. We see their distress and are certain of its cause. We know that they are poor and naked and poor and naked without a crime. What's also really interesting in the debates and the defense of the charity for French prisoners is how it was very often described as simultaneously patriotic and cosmopolitan because it demonstrated the true accomplishments of Britain beyond even its military might. So you can see this in some of the other writings. The writer Oliver Goldsmith talked about the charity for French prisoners in his publication um, saying how um, he picked out the title of one of the benefactors to the charity who self-described as a might, the might of an Englishman, a citizen of the world to Frenchmen, prisoners of war and naked. Um, he very often talked about how these charities made no private distinction of party. And so for him, this was a particular English virtue to rise above um, the partisan nature of, of national identity. And he pointed out especially that English charity, unlike French charity perhaps, was uh, not motivated just by emotional responses such as pity and guilt, but instead governed by reason, as one could see with these charities. And this is, for Goldsmith, this explained why the English treated their national enemies so well, whereas by contrast, he argued that the French were cruel both to other Frenchmen, because they couldn't take care of their own prisoners, but also to the prisoners, the English prisoners that were held in France. And you see this repeated argument about this notion of uh, rational use of charity and rational use, especially of generosity and kindness. So the poet John Langhorne also wrote in praise of the charity for French, French prisoners, decrying the partiality and the passion of patriotism, instead saying, um, told his readers that we need to make our patriotism like our religion rational, nor ever let our hearts be so overstocked with the love of one nation as to shut out the rest of mankind from our benevolence. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting point how in some ways we can think about how this charity and this care defined itself um, as, uh, as being this enlightenment ideal or bienfaisance, this notion that it was in contrast to what was often criticized as ineffective traditional charity, sectarian charity or religious charity. Instead, this form of British charity was described as being rational, universal, humane, and responsive to the changing social conditions of the 18th century. And so this, what I think is interesting is how we see this combination of this notion of a cosmopolitan charity, right? One that goes beyond the bounds of national identity, but at the same time also displays why it is that the English are better than the French. So you get both nationalism and cosmopolitanism um, interrelated. So we can see here how a newspaper published this, this argument that the, the French um, have not that humanity which, which many in English have to raise contributions for the relief of the poor naked soldiers. I'm kind of making fun of a, a French notion that um, they're polite, but they're actually not able to perform what is actually required of them. What I think is interesting is we, of course, can debate whether or not this is actually the case. The Seven Years' War was actually the most fatal war of the century for French sailors, not really because of combat, actually due to the high rates of disease, especially that these French sailors encountered um, in British, on British soils. Um, so at least 
of these enemy prisoners that were held in Britain actually died, um, not of course of combat because they didn't encounter combat in Britain just from disease. So that's a total of, I think it's 11,000 French, French prisoners of war who died on British soil during the war. Um, quite a high number. And it's also quite clear that those numbers were not published in any of these British newspapers. At the same time, French newspapers um, is interesting because we see a marked lack of coverage of anything about these prisoners. Um, the British could not censor news, but the French could. And so French publishing, especially that happening in France was closely regulated. And so what's very interesting is that there's pretty much no discussion of how there's some 35,000 French prisoners held on British soil during the war. There's a brief reference to them when they're released and they're coming back at the end of the war, um, but not much more than that. And so you can really see how the newspapers take part in this public debate. But what I find fascinating is it's always a point of contention. So in the same newspaper in Britain, the London Chronicle, on the one hand, they point out that all this care that's given to these French prisoners is in many ways, it's a symptom and a sign of British national superiority in terms of its fiscal superiority, but also its moral superiority. At the same time, it's also a sign of French military and financial weakness, right? A fact that France is losing during the war. But then you also see other people arguing that perhaps this is not the best way to spend money. And especially this criticism that you see throughout saying how we need to really think about the care and the charity that's given to the prisoners. Um, it reminds readers that without sufficient thought, these supposedly generous acts might instead be, as, as the writer describes it, the slovenly effects of senseless humanity private views or ridiculous fanaticism. What I want to briefly conclude with is just a few thoughts on the kind of long-term legacy um, of this charity and this care, because of course the next major European war that involves both the British and the French is the War of American Independence. And in that war, the welfare and the treatment of prisoners played a significant role in the shaping of public opinion and especially public disapproval of British imperial authority. And that disapproval actually continues today. You can see here a memorial um, to, as they're called, martyrs. Um, so these are prison ships, the prisoners that were held on board prison ships by the British um, and now celebrated as kind of early American um, martyrs to the cause of freedom and independence. And what's interesting is when you look at histories of the treatment of prisoners of war during the American war, many of these actually followed practices from the Seven Years' War. In fact, there was even a charity set up for American prisoners of war on the same model as during the Seven Years' War, but people debated it and partly people criticized it. Um, the proposer of that charity was revealed as a supporter of the American cause, and so it had to be canceled. At the same time that what we see is on the American side, there were a plethora of memoirs that were published many years after the war, very often talking about um, the cruelty at the hands of the British. So very often in marked contrast to those letters by the French Pierre Canot that simply talked about the will of Providence. And so these accounts of these memoirs have retained popularity um, in within American history and within American culture, again, pointing to what they see as being the inhumanity of British authorities and in, very, in various ways, therefore, the treatment of those prisoners of war during the American war has been used as a kind of um, uh, argument and, and evidence for why it is not only that the British lost the war, but also why it is that they deserve to, to lose the war because they were seen as especially cruel tyrants in terms of how they treated prisoners of war. And so what's very interesting in my mind is how the treatment of the prisoners in those two wars was actually the same. What shifted was the way in which the public responded um, to reports about treatment and who was thought to be responsible for the treatment and the care of prisoners of war. So I, I wanna conclude here just with a short historical reflection on the concept of humanitarianism. Because the definition of humanitarianism, according to no less an authority than the Oxford English Dictionary, um, is defined as concern for human welfare as a primary or preeminent moral good, an action or the disposition to act on the basis of this concern rather than for pragmatic 
or strategic reasons. And so what I think is interesting is this modern definition and this understanding of humanitarianism rests precisely on a contrast of humanitarianism with pragmatism and strategic action. But what I hope I've shown is how humanitarianism in the 18th century actually developed as a form of pragmatic military strategy. Humanitarian rhetoric and humanitarian reforms were actually used as tools to try to shape military strategy and try to sustain public support for the war effort, especially as we've seen during the Seven Years' War for the British public. And in this, medicine played a very central role. Medicine has long been at the forefront of humanitarian conventions, such as in the protection for the sick and wounded, um, in the care for prisoners of war, and medical personnel have played very crucial roles in the past, as they continue to do today, in establishing and securing these humanitarian conventions during wartime. So I hope, in some ways, my account has challenge this traditional narrative of the development of humanitarian sentiment. Very often modern histories of humanitarianism see it as an outgrowth of sensibility and an outgrowth of romanticism. And so they see it as a right reaction against the novel hardships and cruelties of modern warfare, even as a reaction against war itself. By contrast, I hope that I've um, demonstrated something of the opposite, that humanitarianism actually developed in the context of war, not as an effort to limit war, but actually as in many ways a patriotic strategy that tried to facilitate more sustainable wars in terms of logistics and politics, and even to provide more effective war making. And in many ways, I think this approach to humanitarianism might allow for a more historical understanding of war and humanitarianism, right? For those in the 18th century, war was not necessarily a problem that had to be solved. And nor unlike in our modern day's understanding of war and humanitarianism, war was not something that could be separated out from society and politics. It's only later in the 18th century with the rise of personal narratives that we see in the American war, with the rise of sentimentality, of popular print culture, and the view that war was an experience. Um, the historian Harari has described it as the ultimate experience. So something that can transform you and take you outside of normal society. So it's really in the later 18th century that we see a cultural transformation in European attitudes towards war. So my point here is that the nature of warfare itself did not necessarily change across the 18th and 19th centuries, but what did change were attitudes towards war and how war was therefore experienced and recorded. So our modern understandings of humanitarianism therefore also rely on modern views of war as something fundamentally unusual, transformative, and problematic. And so as a result, I hope that a historical approach can help to explain how rules and ethics of war were necessarily bound up in warfare and how humanitarianism itself is a part of the ways in which wars can be won or lost. Thank you very much.